in your Bibles this morning for the table of contents. I mean it, I'm serious. And uh, you look under the Old Testament and find a little book by the name of Habakkuk. And then find the page number and turn to it. It, uh, you'll find it snuggling in between Nahum and Zephaniah. I could tell that really turned the lights on for us. Uh, but uh, I want everybody to find this little book, and the reason I ask you to turn to the table of contents is because so often when we can't find one of those little books, we don't want to keep thumbing through the Bible and let our neighbors think we don't know our Bible. So we just open it to Psalms and pretend... That's always easy to find and sort of hold it up like this. Play our cards close to the chest. And, but during these uh, three morning sessions that I have with you, I want to look at this little prophet of Habakkuk. There's several things about it that have always interested me and attracted my attention, but the main thing, and uh, this is really the paramount thing in my estimation about this little book Habakkuk is that it opens with complaining. We'll see that in just a moment when we start reading. But Habakkuk is filled with complaints and griping and grumbling to the Lord because of certain conditions. And then when you turn to the third chapter, the end of the book, in verse 17, he says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will joy in the God of my salvation. That would be a good Thanksgiving sermon, thanking God in spite of everything being in a mess. And the point that I'm making is that it's a little book that opens with complaining and closes with rejoicing. But the interesting thing is that not a single thing has changed. The very things that he was complaining about at the beginning, they have not only not changed, but they have worsened, and yet uh, something has changed because Habakkuk now, instead of complaining, is rejoicing. I think what has changed is Habakkuk. And so I am very interested to discover what happened between verse 1, chapter 1, and chapter 3 in the last verse. I think that would be something worth discovering if God can do something in our lives to take us from complaining to rejoicing even when things don't change. The things that we used to complain about, we now rejoice over. And so in these three morning sessions, I want us to look at this little prophet Habakkuk. And this morning, we're going to read the first six verses of chapter 1. And uh, we'll read these verses, and we're going to be looking at some other verses in chapter 1 and chapter 2, but... Uh, For right now, I want us just to look at the first six verses of Habakkuk chapter 1. Verse 1 gives us the introduction, the title of this little book, The Burden Which Habakkuk the Prophet Did See. And in verse 2, and by the way, let me mention that in chapter 1 and part of chapter 2, you have a dialogue between God and the prophet. The prophet says something and God answers him, and then the prophet says something back and God answers him. So you have this seat saw conversation going on between God and Habakkuk. And in verses 2 through 4, it is Habakkuk speaking. And then in verse 5, God answers him. And then in verse 12, Habakkuk is so upset with the answer that he comes back and so forth. And I think that will help us to understand a little bit. So let's begin again with the first verse. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slack, literally it's gone cold, it's paralyzed, and judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Then God answers, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, 
which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. And then he goes on in the next several verses to describe this nation and describe the horror of the nation as it comes in and raises the land of Judah. Several months ago, I ran across a little book. I was intrigued by the title, How Can It Be All Right When Everything Is All Wrong? And the book was on sale for a dollar and a half, and so I bought it. But I got a lot more than I bargained for. It's well worth the price. I want to read the introduction. It's written by Lewis Smead, who is a professor of theology at Fuller Seminary in California. He says, Believing does not come easy for me. It never has come easy. I suppose it never will. I almost always believe in God in spite of problems and pains that tell me things are so wrong that believing in a good God doesn't make sense. The things I say here are filtered through many years of believing against the grain. Too many people I care about hurt too much to let believing come easy. People close to me get cancer and die too soon. My prayers do not take away the pain or hold back the tolling of the bells. My friends' marriages turn into battlefields and their children go through a hundred kinds of many hells. God doesn't do many miracles for my crowd. But the pains of people in my little orbit are just starters. Those starving children I pray for across the sea keep on dying. And the oppressed people I pray for keep getting their heads banged and their freedoms choked. I'm not whimpering. I know we make many of our own miseries. I'm only admitting that when I believe that God really cares, I feel a lot of hurts that tell me he doesn't seem to care enough. Faith does not break loose in my head with a whooping hurrah for God. Believing sneaks into my soul while my mind is saying, My God, where were you when I needed you? Uh, the phrase that really captivated me was when he said, the things I say here are filtered through many years of believing against the grain. Believing against the grain. It's always refreshing to listen to an honest man. Most of us not be honest enough to say those things even though we feel them. Believing against the grain. Believing is not always come easy, he says. And he's not talking about, and I'm not talking about, the believing in salvation. I'm not talking about that initial act of faith where we discover Jesus Christ and he discovers us, and by faith we embrace him. I'm not talking about that kind of faith, but we're talking about that kind of faith that is required day by day. It is that simple trusting Jesus moment by moment. It is that almost unconscious faith, that unconscious trusting, that natural trusting that most of us do without really even thinking much about. We just know that there is a sovereign God who has set this universe in its orbit and who is running it, and we have trust and confidence that he is doing what is right and what is best. And we go on for years and years, perhaps, never questioning that faith, and all of a sudden a cog breaks and somehow... Something happens and a wrench is thrown into the smooth machinery of our life and all of a sudden we find ourselves believing against the grain. Talking about that kind of faith, this day by day trusting in God and his providence. You see, faith is a buffer. Uh, it's interesting uh, that a uh, great many people, a great many psychiatrists and psychologists, and you can find both kinds, but a great many folks believe that the only sane people are those that are insane. Uh, you see, a sane person has to have certain kinds of buffers. He has to have certain kind of cushions. He has to have certain kind of what the psychologists call lies. They don't mean really lies, but in other words, we tell ourselves that things are going to be all right, that everything's going to work out all right, because you could not live life if you understood the harsh reality of life. If every time you took a step you were afraid you were going to drop dead, you'd never move. But the fact is, every time you take a step, you may drop dead. And every time you get behind the wheel of your car, you may be crushed by a semi-truck and trailer. But if you think about that all the time, you see, you'll never get anything done. You'll, you'll draw in with yourself, and you'll never go outside the door. So you tell yourself certain slogans. We live by slogans. It'll always happen to somebody else. Everything will work out all right. 
And this cushions us and buffers us and allows us to live in this world. And they say that an insane person is one who's finally seen the reality of the whole business and can't take it. Now, you, I, I, I'm very serious. You do, I, I did a study some time ago. It got it's so intriguing. The, uh, so many of the great geniuses of our time and times past have all been insane. Most of the great artists, the great composers, the great, all the geniuses, they were insane. Why? Because they saw life as it really was. No buffer, no cushion. Now, for the believer, for the Christian, it's not a lie, it is faith. And it is faith in the truth of God. But we believe that this world is an ordered world run and controlled by a sovereign God and we have faith that he's going to take care of us and preserve us and that's the buffer that lets us live our lives daily. But every once in a while that cushion gets a little thin and you start feeling the sharp edges of life. And all of a sudden you find it's not quite as easy just to believe as you once did. I want to ask you this morning, why do you believe anyway? Why do you believe? You say, well, i tell you why I believe. I believe because the Bible says all this is true. Well, I, that's why I believe. But I want to tell you something. I can name a half a dozen people today that's so brilliant, so clever, and so smart, they could take this Bible and have you confused in about 15 minutes if you'd listen to them. And if you listen to yourself, you can get yourself confused. I believe because this Bible tells me so, and I believe it's the Word of God, and I put my faith in Him and put my faith in it. But I want to tell you something. Why do you really believe? I mean, why do you really believe? I, I mean that when you find yourself in the dark night of the soul and uh, you can't read the Bible and you can't understand it, besides when you do read it, it doesn't make sense because circumstances are contradicting everything that it says anyway, and, uh, and you're having to hang on to faith and you're having to trust God in spite of everything that's happening, I want to ask you, why do you believe? When you have to reach down, I mean you have to reach down into the soul of your heart and dig up some reason to believe. Why do you believe? I guarantee it's not going to be because some intellectual conviction about the Word of God. It's going to be because somewhere in the depths of your soul you've had an experience with God and you know it's true. But you can't prove it and you can't analyze it and you couldn't share it with anybody else. You just know somewhere down there in the depths you've had an experience with God. You know there's a God and you're trusting in Him, but it's not easy. Why? Because you walk and you see and you feel and you hurt and it's not easy to believe, but you keep on believing. Why? Because down there in the very roots of your soul, you've had an experience with God. Karl Barth, that uh, sweetest theologian that most of us don't agree with, but yet was a great intellect, wrote, well, it'd be wrong to say books. He wrote tomes on church dogmatics and church doctrine. One time he was being interviewed by a reporter, and he said, Dr. Barth, you've written all these volumes about God. He said, how do you know it's true? Carl Barth said, my mother told me. You say, well, he kind of missed it there. No, you go to Timothy, and Paul says, now, Timothy, I want you to remember what you were taught from your mother and your grandmother. Remember as a child. And I may not be able to theologize, I can't say that word, but you know what I'm talking about. And there may be times in my life when I can't come up with a verse of Scripture to prove that God is real and that what I'm going through is all right, but I remember what my mother told me. I remember something way back yonder in the dark recesses of my heart when I met God, and it's still there. But it's not easy to go on believing. And that's where Habakkuk is. Habakkuk's having a hard time believing. He's believing against the grain. You see, a person with faith always has problems. As a matter of fact... Uh, the very moment you start believing, you're going to have a whole new set of problems. The only way to get rid of the problems is to get rid of your faith. You get rid of God and you get rid of all those problems. Now, what I'm talking about is this. The person of faith, and this is why Habakkuk calls his prophecy a burden. Sometimes, folks, believing is a burden. He says, which he saw, because the man of faith sees things other people do not see. We see sin, we see... Uh, uh, degradation, we see injustice, we see crime, and uh, we cry aloud. It hurts us. We see it. It becomes a burden. Other people just pass it by. I, say, I don't see anything unusual about it. No. They're spiritually blind, but the person of faith sees things that others do not see. It becomes a burden on him because he sees those things. And burden is a belief, and believing is a burden. Why? Well, because somebody comes along and says, well, if there is a God and he is good and he's all-powerful, then how do you explain what happened to my little child? How do you explain all of these millions that are starving to death, these innocent children? How do you explain that? That's a problem, isn't it? 
you say it isn't, then you've got your head stuck in the sand somewhere, friend. That is a problem. And I've got news for you. The atheists got a pretty good argument there. That's the argument they always throw up. Well, if there is a God, then he can't be good. Or if he's good, he can't be all-powerful. Or else he would put a stop to all of this. Why did he let Hitler do what he did? Why did he let Stalin do what he did? Why is he letting all those little babies star to death over there? Why did he let... Supreme Court allow abortion and we're slaughtering all of these, killing all of these unborn children every year. Why didn't God do something about it if he's so powerful? That's a problem. How are you going to deal with it? Well, the easiest way is to get rid of God. Then you don't have any problem. It's all what? It's a simple explanation as to why there's injustices and inequities in the world and why those kids are starving. It's because there is no God. And life is just absurdity anyway and everything is by accident and it's just chance and it's just one big crap shoot that's all life is and there is no god so that solves your problem and some of you may have read rabbi kushner's book on when bad things happen to good people it was a bestseller a couple of years ago i saw the rabbi interviewed on television they asked him how he came to write that book he said well as a rabbi i've seen a hundred people die i stood by the side of their bed and i watched people die and said it never shook my faith. It never caused me to question my faith. But he said, my 14-year-old boy died of this aging disease. And he said, as I stood there and watched him day by day grow into an old man and die uh, like he was 90 years old at the age of 14, suddenly I found myself questioning if there is a God in heaven, if he's so good and so powerful, how could he let... You see, folks, it's one thing to objectively talk about these things when it's happening to somebody else. But friend, when the wreath is hanging on your own door, it's a whole other story altogether. And so he questioned. He said, what am I going to do? How can I go on preaching and teaching and believing that there is a good God who is all-powerful and he'll let something like this happen to my boy? His solution was, is found in that book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And his solution was that God is not sovereign. As a matter of fact, one chapter in his book is entitled, God Cannot Do Everything, But He Can Do Some Important Things. His solution was this, that God can do nothing about death, disease, or the devil. And so he solved his problem. Why, well, it's an easy answer as to why my son died. I can go ahead and believe in God and still accept the death of my son because the God I now believe in is powerless to do anything. He'd like to do something about it, but he's powerless to do anything. Now, that may bring comfort to the rabbi, but it doesn't bring much comfort to me because I can't read this Bible without believing that God is sovereign and he can do something about it if he wants to, which creates another problem. If he can do something about it, why doesn't he? I know we quibble over this business of does God cause everything we get in all this sovereignty business? And, and I believe in the sovereignty of God, but don't ask me what that means too much because... Uh, we say, well, did God cause this? Well, no, God doesn't cause it. He just allows it to happen. Well, folks, that's splitting hairs. What difference does it make? I mean, if I'm laying on a bed in the hospital and I'm hurting so much that the dope won't even anymore hush the pain, it's very academic as to whether or not God gave this to me or whether he let it happen. All I know is he could prevent it and could stop it, but he won't. And that's where Habakkuk is. Habakkuk's questioning God. I want to tell you something. The reason that the Bible has people like Habakkuk and Job and Jeremiah in it is to tell us that it's all right to question God. He said, well, I don't think you ought to question God. Listen, I have news for you, friend. Truth never needs to be afraid of inquiry. And if my faith won't stand up against some close investigation, it's not worth having. That's what God was saying through Isaiah. Bring on your gods and compare them to me. God's not afraid to take on anything. And if I can't question God, and I can't question these things, then uh, there's something wrong. This is what God is saying. He's invited. He said, you question me. I'll, I'll deal with you. I want to talk to you this morning on believing against the grain. What are some of those grains that we have to contend with to believe? What, what are some of the problems that we have with faith? And uh, these are the ones that Habakkuk is dealing with. And I want us to look at them. There are three. Number one, one of the problems of faith, one of the grains against which we have to believe is God's apparent indifference. The apparent indifference of God. Now, notice how this uh, chapter opens. Habakkuk opens in verse 2. He says, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? You see what he's saying? He's saying, how long will I have to cry out and you won't hear? 
and I scream violence, and you won't save. In other words, God, you're not doing anything. You're paying me no mind. You're ignoring me. The problem he has is with God's apparent indifference. In verse 2, he says, O Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou will not hear even cry out unto thee. If you're reading out of the King James as I am, you've got two cries there, but they're two different words, actually. The second word, cry out, is a word that means to shriek or to scream. It means a cry of anguish. In the first cry, he's just crying out aloud, but in the second cry, he's really gotten with it, and he's screaming out. That's what he's doing. Habakkuk's not having a quiet time here. He's screaming. It's a distress signal. He's screaming out, and notice what he's screaming. He's saying, violence, violence, robbery, murder, and you won't do anything. Best way I know to compare and illustrate it is, let's suppose that you get out of your car and uh, you're going down to Kmart, and you see a, a fellow over here with a gun, and he's holding up another man is getting ready to shoot him. And over here across the way, you see a policeman, and he's writing a parking ticket. And you start screaming, murder, robbery, violence. You're screaming that. And the policeman hears you scream, and he looks up, and he sees what's happening. He goes back and writes his ticket. And the robbery and the murder and the violence go on. That's exactly what Habakkuk is saying to God. You say, man, I, I would be angry. I, I'm indignant to think that a police officer would just ignore such a plea. Well, what do you think Habakkuk is saying? That's what he's saying exactly about God. He's saying, how long do I have to scream out to you? I'm pointing out to you the violence and the robbery and the murder, and you don't do anything. God's apparent indifference. You know, there are times when God seems to be mighty indifferent to our pleas. Seems to be mighty unmoved by our prayers. I think about that passage over there when Jesus and his disciples were going across the Sea of Galilee. And you remember uh, Jesus fell asleep in the ship and there a storm arose on that sea, which is very common on the Sea of Galilee. And uh, you have to remember also most of these disciples were seasoned sailors. They'd spent most of their lives on that Sea of Galilee. They were used to these storms coming up suddenly, but this one was of such intensity that it scared even these seasoned sailors, and they were frightened, and they ran to Jesus, and they shook him awake. And you remember what they said? They said, Carest thou not that we perish? Lord, don't you care that we perish? We're perishing, and there you are asleep. Sometimes you may feel that way when you pray. You may feel that way when you cry out to God and ask, Lord, why don't you resolve this situation? Why don't you ease the hurt? Why don't you answer my prayer? And you get the impression that God's sound asleep and he couldn't care less what's happening. John chapter 11, Jesus gets word that Lazarus is very ill and Mary and Martha want him to come right away and Jesus waits a couple of extra days. And then he says to the disciples, let's go to Bethany and wake up Lazarus. He's asleep. And they said, well, that's good. Man's sick. He needs his rest. And Jesus said, no, you don't understand. He's dead. We're going to go raise him, wake him up. When they got there, you remember, of course, that Mary and Martha met Jesus at different times, different places, but they both said the same thing to him. Now, if you meet two people at different times and different places and they both say the same thing to you, you know they've been together talking it over. And Mary and Martha met Jesus separately at different times and different places, but they both said the very same thing to him. I used to think that's a great gospel text. <laughs> the Bible's ruined a lot of good sermons I've had through the years. I used to think that's a great good gospel text. You know what they said? They said, the Master is come and calleth for thee. Man, I used to preach on that. The Master is come and is calling for you. Ask the people to come and be saved. That's no more a good old gospel text than the man in the moon. You know what they were doing? They were rebuking Jesus. They said, Master, if you had been here, if you had been here, when, our bro when we called you, our brother would not have died. That's what they said. If you'd been here, our brother would not have died. We get up and I'd preach that and I'd say, boy, if Jesus were in your home, this thing wouldn't have happened. If Jesus were in your life, that's not in the world what they're talking about. They're rebuking Jesus. They're saying, Lord, if you had answered our prayer when we told you to, this wouldn't have happened. Lord, if you had come when we asked you to, this couldn't have happened. Master, if you'd been here, our brother would not have died. And it seemed that Jesus was cold and indifferent. And that's a problem we have to contend with at times. And I've got news for you, friend. You're gonna, you have times, you know that, you have times when it seems that God's indifferent, God's unconcerned. You can't get his attention. 
Why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he do something? There's a second problem that Habakkuk has to contend with, and you and I have to contend with it also, and that's the problem of God's unusual and unexpected methods. God's unexpected methods. Now, uh, there, there's some uh, humor here, I think, in this. Uh, in verse 5, God answers him. Uh, Habakkuk is just complaining and griping and grumbling because God's not doing anything. And so in verse 5, God says, All right, I, he says, Be amazed, behold you among the heathen. Now, he addresses this to the heathen, actually. He's talking to Habakkuk, but he's, saying, he's using irony here in satire. He's saying, Jews won't believe this, but maybe the heathen will believe it. Sometimes the world is quicker to believe what God has said than we are. And uh, he says, Behold you among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously. Be amazed, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. What God is saying is, Habakkuk, I'm, uh, you want to know why I don't do something, and why don't I do something about the situation? I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, but I, you won't believe it when I tell you. And more than that, you won't like it when you find out what it is I'm going to do. But here's what I'm doing. Verse 6, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march to the breath of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. In verse 9, They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. I mean, God is painting a terrible picture of what these Chaldeans are going to do when they come in. Now, here's what God is saying. Habakkuk's been saying, Lord, why don't you do something? Uh, these people need to be chastened. These people need to be judged. These are God's people, and yet uh, they're robbing each other. They're cheating each other. They're bribing the judges, and you can't get a decent hearing in any court, and the whole thing is uh, in a mess, and Lord, you ought to do something about it. Our nation needs to be judged and chastened. We need revival, God. Why don't you do something? And so in verse 5, God says, okay, I, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You think Judah needs to be judged and needs to be chastened? I agree with you. Here's what I'm going to do. Lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, and they shall march across the breadth of your land, and they'll sit down like sitting down to supper and sup you up, and they're going to gather you in their hands like sand and carry the whole bunch of you off into captivity. Well, when I back, I heard that. That was worse. Now he's really upset. Oh, this is not what I had in mind at all. In verse 12, he says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. Habakkuk saying, Lord, you remember now. Remember, get, don't, don't, don't get us confused. We're the ones that you've ordained. We're the ones that are to be saved, and they're the ones that are supposed to be judged. Now, just a minute, Lord. Uh, you've got this thing backwards. Habakkuk wanted an answer. I don't know where ever in the world we got the idea of God just explain everything to us, we'd be at peace. Some of us would say, well, if God just tell me what he's doing, if God just tell me what he's up to, then I could rest. No, you wouldn't. Yeah, when I started traveling a, little, a bunch of years ago, we decided it'd be good for my wife to take care of the finances and the books and all that sort of stuff because I, I, I'm not very good at that, and, and she's excellent at it. And So through the years, it, it's gotten to where I just, you know, she pays the bills and takes care of the finances and everything because I'm on the road so much. It would be a catastrophe if it's left to me. And uh, so consequently, I, I couldn't tell you this morning within a million dollars of how much money I've got in the bank. It's something less than a million. <laughs> Quite a bit less, I imagine. But I, I really don't know. And I want to tell you something. I don't want to know. Every once in a while I'll come in and she'll say, well, I paid bills this week. You want to know how much we have? I said, I don't want to know. And she'll tell me. Friend, I want to tell you something. Uh, ignorance is bliss as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Knowledge of how much money I have doesn't bring me peace at all. Uh, right before Christmas, I was having to do a lot of shopping on the road, you know, Christmas shopping. She called me one day, tracked me down somewhere in Arkansas. She said, don't use your Visa card anymore. She said, we just got the bill. You want to know how much it is? I said, no, I don't. And she told me anyway. It certainly didn't bring peace to my heart. It upset me terribly. 
And yet you and I somehow feel that if God would just explain himself and tell us why he's letting this happen and why he's doing this, that we'd be content. I have an idea we'd be more frustrated and upset than we are now. Listen, I've got, I want to tell you something, friend. I am thankful to God he kept from me all the things that are happening in my life. If when I started out a bunch of years ago, if I had known every turn in the road, I would have jumped out of a window. I couldn't take it. I don't want to know everything that's happened. You say, well, I just want to know good things. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. Why do you think God forbids us to practice the occult, seeing that which is unknown, that which is hidden? God does it for us. We get the idea God's trying to keep something from us, doesn't want us to know. You're right. And it's for our own good. He doesn't want us to know. He doesn't want us to know. I've got news for you, friend. If my 24-year-old son gets killed today in a car wreck, I'm glad I didn't know it for 24 years. If I'd have known it for 24 years, every day of my life would have been a day of anguish as I looked at him. God doesn't tell us these things, and yet we think, well, if God just tell us, why, uh, we'd be satisfied. Well, God said, all right, back, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. And when he told him to just upset back a, back a more than it was, I want you to know something he said. I think this is good. In verse 13, he says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. Suddenly we get real theological. And canst not look on iniquity. You see, we don't understand. If God is so pure and, and cannot look on iniquity, then how in the world can God use people like the Chaldeans? Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and hold thy tongue? Now here's what's really getting to Habakkuk. When the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than he. Now, do you know what is really aggravating every one of us? It's because God is letting the wicked devour people that are more righteous than the wicked. You know what aggravates me? It's that God lets fellows pastor bigger churches than I do, and he's more wicked than I am. That's right. I'm telling the truth. He said, I, don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Is that the truth, John? John knows. I take you some of these super churches, mega churches, and uh, fellas stand at the helm of them, not worth the gunpowder it takes you. <laughs> telling the truth. Now, you understand, I'm not saying about that about all of them. By no means am I. What I'm saying is there are some here and there that are that way. What I want to understand is why is it here I am trying to live a holy life, trying to live a godly life, and trying to, to hold on to my personal integrity and trying to obey God. And here's some fellow over here who has no integrity and uh, who will do anything to get ahead and is politicking and manipulating. And by Jove, he does get ahead. He does. God, how can you let, how can you let that happen? The wicked devouring the man that is more righteous than he. Habakkuk has a problem with God's unexpected methods. You know, God uses methods that we don't expect. And what God is doing here is God is literally using a pagan, heathen, godless nation to do his work. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. God is not above using the most sinful and the most godless means to accomplish his work. And he's doing it now in certain areas. God's unexpected methods. God uses means and methods that we we weren't expecting. When, when, When Habakkuk was praying and screaming for God to do something, what he thought was this that God would come down and uh, do it the way Habakkuk had programmed. He would do this according to Habakkuk's vision. And that, you see, uh, if he had known that God was going to do it the way God was going to do it, Habakkuk would never have complained about the condition in the first place. I couldn't help but think when John was preaching this morning about the condition of our country, and we complain about it, I want to tell you something. If I knew exactly what God's going to do about it, I might not complain. I might say, Lord, I believe I can put up with a little humanism. I believe, Lord, I can put up with a little bit of sin. I believe I can put up with it. 
if you're going to sob it that way. Now, that's exactly what Habakkuk is saying, friend. All of us praying for revival, praying that God would do something about our country. You know what the parallel is here, don't you? It's all be obvious to everybody by now. What if God came to you and said, okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to answer your prayers for revival. And the only way that revival is going to come is when the people get on their knees and start crying out for mercy and repenting of sin. So I've raised up the Russians, and they're going to come across your land and suck you up as dinner, and they're going to gather you into their hands like sand and carry you off into captivity. That's the obvious parallel for us in this day. Now, let me ask you a question, friend. If that was the alternative, would you still complain about the conditions in your land? You see, most of us are willing to give up our own personal holiness and freedom for a guarantee of a good life. You see, if God can just guarantee me a good life or there's something that can guarantee, Lord, I'm going to be dead in 40 years more than likely anyway. If I can just somehow live out the rest of my days in comfort and ease and convenience, I can tolerate just about anything. I've long lost my zeal for holiness godliness and revival because I've grown accustomed to live in this way and I enjoy it. And when I was young and foolish and didn't know any better, I used to pray for revival and God's judgment and I had a zeal for holiness, but I have grown accustomed to live in this way and I enjoy it and I want to live out the rest of my days in a nice, comfortable ministry where people love me and I want to be able to go shopping when I go shopping. I want to be able to buy a car when I want to buy a car and I want to be able to have all the things that I'm accustomed to and having my family around me and growing old in my, in my years and full and satisfied, Lord, I believe. If you don't mind, you can wait until the next generation to bring revival. And by the way, wait until the next one after that. I hate to see my kids go through it. All I'm saying to you, friends, is if we understood God's methods and how he used, we'd be as upset as Habakkuk was. God's unexpected methods. Well, there's one last thing. And uh, we'll finish. The other grain against which Habakkuk has to believe is God's unhurried purpose. Now, chapter 2, verse 1 is re- very interesting because you get the impression that Habakkuk has certainly uh, come to and realized well, who he's talking to. It doesn't come out in the English translations, but actually in the text he's sort of stuttering. It reads something like this, I, uh, I, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. What Habakkuk is saying, he's been, he's been just complaining against God's methods, and all of a sudden it comes to him, I'm talking to God. I think I'll uh, go over here and sit down and uh, wait and see what God say to me. Hush falls upon Habakkuk because he suddenly remembers who he's talking to, and he says, I'll, I'll wait and see what God's going to say to him, and and I think I will go ahead and get an answer for him when I'm reproved, because I have a suspicion that God's going to rebuke me, and so I'm going to get my answer ready. And in verse 2, God answers him, and the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now, God says, I want you to write this down, because what's going to happen is not going to happen immediately, and you forget about it, so I want you to write it down, preserve it, because my purpose is certain, but it's not immediate. Write the vision, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Now, when God is using the word vision, when he's talking about vision, He's talking about the, the, the uh, deliverance that when God finally comes and makes everything right, when he finally comes and vindicates faith, when he finally comes and justifies belief in him, that's what he's talking about. The vision is yet for an appointed time. What he's saying is, Habakkuk, deliverance is certain and justice is certain and I am going to see to it that you're vindicated and I am going to see to it that you're justified, but... It's not going to happen right away. You better write it down, lest you forget it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. And he says, though it tarry, wait for it. And then he ends it up by saying, it will not tarry. And there again, uh, he's using two different words. The last word literally sort of means like this. The best way to read it, I think, is like this. Though it tarry, it shall not be tardy. 
What God is saying is that vision, that deliverance, that justice that you want to come is going to come. It's not going to come right away. It's going to tarry, but it's not going to be late. It's going to be right on time. Why? Because it's an appointed time. God has said it, and it is an appointed time. And though it tarry, you wait for it, because though it tarry, it will not be tardy. It just meant to wait. And folks, that's the hardest thing any of us have to do, is to wait, because we want immediate justification. We want immediate solution. We live in a, we live in a instant credit world, instant coffee, instant tea, instant everything, and we want God to act instantly on our behalf. Now, if you turn over to Hebrews chapter 10 and read this, Habakkuk's quoting. I mean, the writer of Hebrews is quoting Habakkuk. But he makes one significant change. Here, Habakkuk says, Though it tarry, wait for it, for it shall surely come. In Hebrews 10, 38, I believe it is, he says, Though he tarry, wait for him, for he shall surely come. He's not talking about second coming. He's talking about the Lord coming to you. The Lord coming to you and meeting you. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. You say, what's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? All the difference in the world in that it gets better. The farther along you read in the book, the better it gets. In Habakkuk, it was an it. In Hebrews, it's a he. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this is we, we had really, I'm going to tell you something. Most of us are Old Testament type believers. We want to keep the it. Lord, when I'm praying for deliverance, what I mean is it. I mean, I want to specify, I, I want to be healed, I, uh, I, I want my leg lengthened, I want my eyes fixed, I want my ears unstopped. Lord, I want my economic situation resolved, I want my wandering son to come home. Lord, this is the it. I mean, this is the it. And God comes and says, listen, it may not be an it, you may not get the healing that you want. You may not get exactly what you want, but what you're going to get is He. He will come to you. He will come to you. The Lord will come to you. Now, I want to tell you something, folks. What do you think is better? There have been many times I've disappointed, been disappointed because all I got was the Lord. And I wanted something else. And all I got was the Lord. You ever been disappointed like that? Now, don't lie to me. You know Lord, what I had in mind, and God says, I'm going to give you something better. He said to Abraham over there in Genesis 17, he says, I will be thy reward. In the very next verse, Abraham turns around and says, what will you give me? God says, I am thy reward. Abraham says, what are you going to give me? And sometimes all I've got now, the deal, is just fresh visitation from the Lord. What a disappointment. What I wanted... Was a thousand dollars, and all I got was the Lord. He will come. He. Will. I love that psalmist where he says, "Behold, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there." I want to tell you something. If you can find God in hell, you can find Him anywhere. And I got news for you: you can find Him in hell. And you make your bed in hell, behold, He is there. I pray that God will help us come to the place where it's not a disappointment, and all we get out of the deal is the Lord. God's unhurried purpose. He said, it's for an appointed time. You wait for it. Though it tarry, it shall not be tarted. Could you bow your heads with me now as we pray together? Dear Lord, I, I pray that you'll, uh, you'll help folks to realize that I don't mean to be irreverent, but there are times when, for many of us, in the very depths of our being, we question some things, because we don't understand, and we do have to believe against the grain. And sometimes the cushion of our faith gets so thin that we begin to feel some of the sharp edges. Somehow all along we thought that faith would buffer us and cushion us so much that we'd never feel any of the edges that other people have to feel. That there'd be some kind of immunity, some kind of vaccination, some kind. 
a pass from the teacher that would keep us from having to feel any of these things. Somehow we had the idea that all we had to do, as it said this morning, just name it and claim it and confess it and possess it and just visualize it and believe it and there it be. And yet we discover that in the real working out of our salvation and living our Christian life, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. For some it does, and for us it does sometimes, but not always. The general rule is that it doesn't. And we, like Habakkuk, and like Job, and Jeremiah, and David, and like saints all through the ages, we've had to wrestle with this problem. Why doesn't God do what we think he ought to do? And why isn't God doing anything? I thought he was with pure eyes than to behold iniquity. Why does he make me have to look upon iniquity? Lord, why do you cause your servant to have to look upon iniquity? Why don't you do something? And we're grateful for the promise that the vision is coming and it's for an appointed time. I pray that you'd help us to have a holy patience to wait and to wait in an anticipation and to wait in faith. And Lord, we do believe. We do believe. We believe in spite of all the arguments of the atheists and all the arguments of the liberals and all the arguments of our own feelings. We do believe. We reach down into the roots of our soul and we do believe because we have met you and experienced you and we know you. And so we trust you. And I pray that you'd help us to trust you more perfectly. Bless your word to our hearts this day, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.